As always, I want to acknowledge uh, with humbleness and gratitude that we're hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh nations, and the Métis Charter Community of the Lower Mainland region, and all of you around this uh, province and wherever else you are uh, on Turtle Island are actually coming from um, your territories and acknowledge uh, with a lot of gratitude um, how lucky we are to live on this land and how we need to learn to take care of it um, in a much more uh, thoughtful way than perhaps we have in the past. Next slide. So I'm going to introduce two of our essentially senior fellows. Uh, at first, Dr. Raphael Harrison and then Nisha uh, Rao. Uh, Raphael completed his nephrology fellowship at the University of Laval in Quebec City in 2020 and has joined us at UBC uh, renal, BC Renal Home Dialysis Fellowship Program in March of 2021. Due to an unfortunate, um, I think it was um, rollerblading accident, <laughs> he ended up having to extend his um, fellowship, uh, which is great for us and has a specific interest in patient safety and quality improvement initiatives. And he's going to present his uh, project on quality indicators for peritoneal and home dialysis. Following that, Nisha Rao one second, uh, will be actually looking at, uh, it, Nisha is a nephrologist and general physician from Melbourne, Australia, who's completing her home dialysis fellowship um, within our um, BC Renal UBC uh, Division of Nephrology. And she has a special interest in home therapies as a bridge to renal transplantation, also interested in renal supportive care, green nephrology and perioperative medicine. She's already done a master's of public health at the University of Sydney and a master's of perioperative medicine from Monash. And so after this, she's like the most highly qualified nephrologist, <laughs> junior nephrologist in Australia, I think, going back. And her project will be on uh, quantification uh, of recyclable PD plastics and incremental PD. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over, I think, first to Raphael and then to Nisha. Is that correct? So thank you both for prepare for all the work that you've done and for joining us here and enriching this program. Um, but also for sharing with us your uh, learnings and thoughts. So over to you. You're on mute, just FYI. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yep. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction and reminding me of my glorious fall <laughs> back in uh, back in the last summer, uh, Dr. Levin. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, for letting me presenting my project. I uh, have been working on this for a couple of months with a wonderful team. Um, so for the presentation today. Um, so first, we will go over the background and the specific objectives of this project. Uh, then I will introduce you guys to the domains that we've selected and the indicators um, that have been selected for the first version of the report and try to provide an overview of why. And to conclude, I will show you the expected format of the report and some pictures from the first draft as well. So as you might know, uh, quality indicators are important tools to measure and improve the quality of care. Performance measurement may be particularly helpful to grow disciplines that are underutilized but cost-effective, such as home dialysis therapies. The aim of this report is to identify and prioritize home dialysis quality indicators in British Columbia. By doing so, we hope to create an empowerment to collect and regularly look over our data as a province. The collected information will be comp complementary to the in and out reports uh, we're doing and will allow programs to get more real-time data. This report will allow us to monitor global and specific programs performances in regards to the selected indicators. 
This will also be an opportunity to compare within and between health authorities when appropriate. So for the selected domains, after previous attempts to design such a project by my colleagues in the past, reviewing the program's current priorities and searching for relevant literature, we decided to aim for six specific domains for the first version of this report. As you can see, these are prevalence, intake, attrition, safety, monitoring, and patient-centered care. So we'll start first with the peritoneal dialysis selected indicators. Um, so first of all, obviously, we want to be looking at the prevalence of PD. Um, that's a given. For intake, uh, we'll collect data on the incidence, the percentage of patients with PD catheter inserted for the first time who started PD within three months of insertion as well as where the patients are coming from and within what time frame, We do believe that these indicators will help us identify opportunities to make a significant impact on patient selection, timely referral and education, in addition to recognizing some potential challenges related to delays in therapy initiation. Looking at attrition numbers and especially specific reasons could help identify barriers to sustainable PD with a focus on modifiable factors. We want to look at the attrition rate at six months, 12 months, and then further categorize if possible. For safety, um, following the peritonitis rate over time is very important clinically and all centers should always be working to continuously improve their peritonitis rates. For monitoring, um, we wanted to look at 24-hour urine collection for creatinine clearance, uh, but we actually found out recently that this information is actually incomplete and promised, so this indicator will need to be put on hold for now. Otherwise, we will examine the percentage of patients with hemoglobin measurements outside of our usual target, uh, and we chose between 95 and 115. We also felt that it was important to include indicators that were related to patient-centered care and that reflect equitable access to home therapies. To do so, we decided to look at data on the proportion of patients who chose PD and actually started on this preferred modality at dialysis initiation and within the first three months of chronic renal replacement therapy. For the distance indicator that you can see uh, at the bottom here, um, we are still figuring out the best way to process the data and present it, uh, so it will likely not be a part of the first version. Uh, we need to find a tool to actually calculate distance and also make sure that all postal codes are actually registered properly in PROMIS, as most of this information is actually drawn from PROMIS. Now let's switch to home hemodialysis. Um, so as you will notice, uh, most of them are similar. Obviously, once again, prevalence numbers will be included. Um, for intake, uh, we will take a look at various indicators. First of all, we will follow the incidence of home hemodialysis and the percentage of patients who started training coming from KCC, in-center HD or community dialysis units and transplant. This will provide us with valuable information to make sure timely referrals, patient education, as well as selection are done and maybe contribute to identify some modifiable barriers to home HD. We want to also take a look at median wait time overall and median time from in-center HD to home HD training to potentially once again identify delays towards consideration and referral to this program. Other specific indicators related to training will include the percentage of patients successfully transitioning to home after training, the median training time, and the vascular access used during home HD training. For the domains of attrition, 
monitoring and patient-centered care, we have similar indicators as you can see. So for attrition, once again, at six months, at, tw at 12 months, and try to further categorize if possible for monitoring the same hemoglobin targets. And for patient-centered care, choice versus actual, and the distance will be on hold as well for now. I will now show you some pictures and provide more information on the report itself. Um, so this report will actually be HTML based and hosted on Promised. As of right now, we only have preliminary data uh, and we are still in the testing phase of development. So as you can see, uh, we have our selected domains on top as tabs that you can click. And each tab uh, will actually grant you access to the indicators you would like to review. This main page um, will also be showing relevant data for our indicators in a list format and will allow a quick look to compare each health authority to BC overall and between themselves. So like I said, each tab will actually allow you to access the specific data within each domain. So there is an example for prevalence of PD over time. So as shown, you can see that you have the data for BC as a red line and each health authority will be represented with its own color. Um, you will also have a couple of tools that you can actually use while you're navigating the report, you will be able to display and even compare specific data you want to look for on hover with these tools on the right. Um, so you can look at all the numbers or select two lines and then compare. For most of the indicators, you will be able to access your health authority specific numbers. The little camera symbol that you can see on the top right will allow you to take a snapshot of the data you're consulting, and that could then be used for reporting within your group. Um, so here's an example for Vancouver Coastal. We have a global number for the province overall within, within this health authority, and specifically for samples and for BGH. So here we have another example of how the data could be presented on the website. With here, all data for BC and health authorities showed on the same page after clicking on the appropriate tab for incidents. So to finish up, we are currently in the phase of actually collecting the data and computing it into the database, as well as working on the functionality of the report, as well as its layout. We are hopeful for the first version of the report to be published during the summer of 2022, but there is some possibility of delays uh, up until September, October, but for now we're still hopeful. So as a few last words, uh, I wanna thank everyone who was involved uh, in my team for that project. Um, and thank you for joining us this morning. And I'll, I'll be happy to hear any questions or comments. Uh, I think for the time being, we're gonna defer live questions at the end of the talk after Anisha's done. But that being said, if you wanna send me an email or if you wanna ask a question in the chat, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Raphael. On to you, Anisha, and then we'll go from there. Share my screen. Um, can you guys see that at the moment? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to talk today. I'll be talking about two projects I did, one with, um, oh, I can't advance my slides. Okay. One with Dr. Schwartz at Fraser Health to do with incremental peritoneal dialysis and a green nephrology project looking at recyclable PD waste with um, Caroline Stigant in, in VIHA. So I'm going to start with the incremental peritoneal dialysis project. Um, start by actually defining what incremental peritoneal dialysis is. So it is the practice of initiating peritoneal dialysis with less than four exchanges per day, considering your patient's residual kidney reserve with the view to actually increase the prescription once the kidney function declines further. It does not mean we start peritoneal dialysis earlier than planned. We start incremental PD at the same time as you would start someone on full dose peritoneal dialysis. When you look at the literature, there is no standard definition on what incremental peritoneal dialysis 
is in terms of a prescription. However, this paper by Blakey et al that was published in PDI in 2020 has this table that sort of shows you what incremental peritoneal dialysis could look like. And as you can see, the, the prescription is quite variable. However, in essence, it is starting peritoneal dialysis at less than full dose, keeping into account your patient's residual kidney reserve. So in a suitable patient, it could mean that they fill at night, sleep whilst the peritoneal dialysis dwell and drain in the morning with one exchange a day to begin their dialysis journey. It gives our patients time to get accustomed to a new therapy and a new way of life with end-stage kidney disease. I'd like to remind everyone the goals of PD. The ISPD guidelines have now revised their goals to give goal-directed peritoneal dialysis with individualized PD targets, which means that we provide peritoneal dialysis that is required to keep a per person well. With that in mind, incremental peritoneal dialysis has three requirements. Providing an initial prescription that is less than full dose, the initial prescription does not by itself meet the clearance goals, but when combined with your residual kidney reserve, you achieve your clearance goals. And there is an intention to increase peritoneal dialysis as the kidney function declines. So this is a pictorial format of the same concept, essentially saying that when your kidney function declines in time, your peritoneal dialysis prescription will increase. Because of this, it is actually paramount that we discuss with our patients and be upfront with them, explaining to them that when they start this kind of therapy in time, when their kidney function declines, they will need a bigger dose of peritoneal dialysis. As you can see in this single center retrospective study, they experienced the same thing, which we expect. Dialysate volumes increased from 4.5 to 8 liters at five years, and 32.6% of patients in this study graduated to full dose peritoneal dialysis at about 10 months. The risk factors to go to full dose PD within one year was male, higher BMI, and lower serum al albumin. So that paper in PDI recommends the following um, for monitoring your patients on incremental PD. So review of prescription every three months or earlier if your patients have unexplained symptoms, review volume status and labs every month, and 24-hour urine collections for your normal adequate calculations. And we need to aim to increase the prescription once kidney function declines. This is not out of the standard of care for our patients. Our patients get monthly labs. We see them three monthly in clinic. So we're not actually asking patients who commence peritoneal, incremental peritoneal dialysis to do more. They're doing what is the standard of care for our patients already. So what are the advantages? The most attractive one is the first one. You offer them a less onerous initial prescription. So essentially you give them time to get accustomed to a dialysis therapy and master that therapy. There is some evidence that it leads to preservation of residual kidney reserve as well. And there is a theoretical benefit of preservation of membrane with less glucose exposure, less mechanical complications, theoretical risk of lower peritonitis rates because of lesser connections, and the added benefit of saving healthcare dollars without actually compromising patient care. When you look at this paper at, um, that was published in PDI, uh, the same paper that I mentioned before, it's an excellent read if you haven't had a read already, but I'll draw your attention to the last of the summary statements, which essentially says that there is some evidence to suggest that incremental peritoneal dialysis is as good as full dose peritoneal dialysis, and we actually don't cause harm with this type of treatment. So, if you're starting your patient in the right patient, incremental peritoneal dialysis will not cause harm to your patient. When you look at this study by Lee et al, they looked, it was a single center retrospective study in Seoul, and they looked at 175 incremental peritoneal dialysis patient, compared them to full dose. The exclusion criteria is listed there. So their primary aim was time to anuria. The secondary outcomes, they looked at peritonitis, technique failure, and all-cause mortality. 
When you look at the time to anuria, incremental PD, as you can see here with this graph, exhibited a lower risk of developing anuria. And when they looked further at independent predictors, younger age and history of transplantation were also predictors of longer time to anuria. So in essence, incremental peritoneal dialysis in this study showed that it was beneficial in preserving kidney reserve. When you looked at patient survival, technique-free survival and peritonitis-free survival, in this study, there was no difference between the two groups. So with all that in mind, we looked at this QI project at Fraser Health. So we wanted to study if offering incremental peritoneal dialysis in the right population in Fraser could lead to more patients choosing peritoneal dialysis. And to study if the availability of this as a modality choice increased the overall number of patients on peritoneal dialysis. We also wanted to look at the number of patients that were previously planned for peritoneal dialysis um, to see if they crashed onto hemo and if we could reduce that numbers. And we wanted to study if incremental PD would lead to greater preservation of residual kidney function. Unfortunately, with the last sub point, we were unable to collect data to present today for that. For the purposes of the analysis, we used the de definition that incremental PD would be anyone that had three or less exchanges per day. It's so a QI audit, it's observational study, and we used educational material in the form of PowerPoint pre presentations, which was given by the nephrology fellow that was myself, um, to all the peritoneal dialysis patient care coordinators at the three sites being Surrey, Abbotsford and Royal Columbian, uh, and to the KCC nurses over the periods of April to mid-May 2021. We also looked at the KCC slide deck and made one change for the three sites because when we were speaking to staff and patients, most people found this bit a little bit daunting done during the day, four exchanges per day. It just felt a bit too much for patients without actually understanding the therapy. So we simplified it to this slide and asked the, patient, um, asked the educators to verbalize that this could mean anything from incremental PD to four exchanges a day so that patients could uh, be less threatened about peritoneal dialysis as a modality choice. We collected data uh, from November 2020 to mid-May 2021 as the pre-intervention period and May mid-May 2021 to November 2021 as the post-intervention period. We use PROMISE and BC in and out report to help with data collection. So what did we find? When we looked at just the raw numbers, in the pre-intervention period at Fraser, there were 73 patients that were commenced on peritoneal dialysis. This went up to 93 patients post-intervention, which was a 27% increase. When you actually look at the incidents coming from KCC, we again found an increase. So 29% of patients were on peritoneal dialysis pre-intervention. This increased to 36% post-educational intervention. And then we went to stratify to see if incremental peritoneal dialysis specifically made a difference in these numbers. And pleasingly it did. So 12.3% of patients were on incremental PD already pre-intervention and that jumped to 25.81%. When you look at the referrals from KCC specifically, most of our referrals obviously came from there. So 54 of 73 referrals um, for peritoneal dialysis pre-intervention was from KCC and 69 out of the 93 in the post-intervention were from KCC. And the green tabs are incremental peritoneal dialysis. So again, the numbers went up from 12.9% to about 29% post-intervention period. We then looked at referrals for peritoneal dialysis from in-center hemo. And interestingly, the numbers here also went up. So if you look at the green tabs, went up from 7.6% to about 15%. And this finding is interesting because we didn't actually um, target our education to the hemo staff. And it will be interesting to look at at a later stage if these patients were patients that were previously planned for um, peritoneal dialysis and crashed onto hemo. 
When we looked at peritoneal dialysis referrals from community hemodialysis, again, there was a percentage increase in numbers. However, these numbers are very, very small and need to be examined with caution. We then looked at specific sites to see if one site was contributing more or doing better than the others. And pleasingly, all three sites, Abbotsford, Royal Columbian and Surrey, the incremental PD numbers went up in all sites. So 10 to 22% in Abbotsford, 13 to 20% in RCH and 12.5 to 37.5% at Surrey. So a bigger increase in Surrey. And pleasingly, there was no significant change in EGFR at the start of dialysis in the pre and post intervention period, which is in line with what's recommended for incremental PD starts. Lastly, we looked at chronic starts from KCC, so patients who chose peritoneal dialysis but were started on hemodialysis. Pleasingly, this number dropped, so dropped from 27.4% to 21.3%. So we were able to retain more people onto peritoneal dialysis who chose peritoneal dialysis to begin with. Obviously, this study has a lot of limitations. It was an observational audit, very small numbers. And in few cases, we had nephrology and clinician pu pushback to uh, incorporate incremental PD in the units. I'd like to conclude this talk by saying that educational sessions in our setting for KCC staff proved to be beneficial in increasing awareness of incremental PD as a, as a modality choice. And this overall led to the increase in incidence of patients on peritoneal dialysis. We found that patients who chose peritoneal dialysis at KCC were more likely to stay on peritoneal dialysis in the post-intervention period. So where to from here? It will be nice to be able to incorporate incremental peritoneal dialysis, uh, teaching to KCC staff and staff in general in more sites. And it will be important to actually collect more objective data from patients to understand if actually having incremental peritoneal dialysis as a modality choice played a role in their overall decision-making process in choosing peritoneal dialysis. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge Daniel Schwartz, Ruth Burns, and everyone in the home dialysis sites at Fraser Health to help with this project. Um, I will now move on to my next talk, which is quite dear to my heart, and it is to do with green nephrology. So I was lucky enough to have the pleasure to go to Victoria and work with Dr. Caroline Stigant on this project. Um, we looked at quantifying recyclable PD plastic in a home dialysis program at VHA. As you all know, a climate emergency has been declared in Canada, and this is a significant healthcare issue. And it's important to us in the healthcare community because the healthcare industry plays a significant part to the carbon emission load. 4.2% in Canada in 2018, 7% in Australia in 2014, and 10% in the United States in 2013. And this is important to us in the kidney care world. We have a big role to play. Kidney services emissions are amongst the highest in healthcare provision. Healthcare pollution is a patient safety issue. This flow chart that was published in Green Nephrology by Catherine Barraclough et al. nicely demonstrates the problem. Climate change leads to rising temperatures, altered rainfall patterns and extreme weather conditions. And all of these things, unfortunately, we've experienced in BC in the last year. And why is this important to us in the kidney care community? It leads to increased stone formation, increased AKI, increased chronic kidney disease. And things like flooding, bushfires leads to infrastructural damage. We've had instances where the highway is being closed, patients cannot get their supplies delivered in time, it leads to disruption in kidney care. I recently sat in two committee meetings, the home hemo and the peritoneal dialysis committee meetings. And the first thing on the agenda was this, how do we actually combat this problem with supply delivery when you have natural disasters? So as you know, we had the floods recently in November and earlier in 2021, we had 
the heat germ, horrible bushfires causing catastrophic damage to cattle, wildlife, landscape, and human life. It is not an insignificant issue. So we looked at peritoneal dialysis and looked at the waste generated by us to see if we can quantify this and overall make a difference in the future. So solid waste generation from peritoneal dialysis is a cause of dissatisfaction, both for patients and staff. We wanted to quantify the plastic waste generated by peritoneal dialysis, as this would form a foundational step in determining the overall carbon footprint of peritoneal dialysis. And it would also provide us with vital, crucial information for negotiations with potential recyclers. Currently, there is no recycling program for non-biohazardous medical waste in BC. And when I say non-biohazardous waste, I mean anything that has not been in contact with the effluent. So in Australia and New Zealand, we're lucky in some senses because Baxter runs a recycling program with the Vinyl Council of Australia. And what happens is Baxter delivers supplies to patients and at the same time of delivery, they collect recyclables from patients. The inflow dialysate bag, the soft outer cover plastic and the cardboard boxes. As I mentioned before, anything that comes in contact with the effluent cannot be recycled. The Vinyl Council of Australia then sends these uh, products to recycling sites where they are washed and granulated and then they form materials with that like play mats, hoses, etc, which is used again in the community. So with the view to come up with something similar or even better in BC and Canada, we came up with this project here. Mm -hmm. We looked to quantify the amount of potentially recyclable plastic waste generated by the home dialysis program at Royal Jubilee Hospital. We wanted to look at the outer cover bags, that's the polypropylene plastic, and the inflow dialysate bags, which is the polyvinyl chloride plastic. And to extrapolate these results provincially, we use the BC in and out report. So medical records were used to determine individual PD prescriptions. All the soft plastic, that is the polypropylene plastic and the inflow dialysate, the PVC plastics, were weighed with sensitive scales. We used the BC in and out report to get provincial level data. And we used the waste reduction model tool to calculate greenhouse gas emissions. So the WARM tool is a tool that's readily available online for free, and it's generated by the US Environmental Protection Agency. It's there for companies to be able to calculate their own greenhouse gas emissions. So what did we find? So at, in the Royal Jubilee Hospital in September of 2021, 19, oh, sorry, 19% of patients were on CAPD and the remainder of the patients were on CCPD, 51% on the home choice, 30% on the AMIA. And if you're wondering why I made the distinction between the home choice and the AMIA machine, it is because the AMIA machine actually generates more waste per treatment. So the AMIA machine has an extra heater bag per exchange, adding 50.92 grams of plastic per treatment. And I can assure you, while that number there seems very small, when you add it to the provincial numbers, it makes a huge difference. So just in pictorial format, this is what we consider recyclable. So it's the outer cover or the inflow dialysate bags. This is for CAPD, this is for CCPD. And here is the extra plastic bag generated by the AMIA machine, the heater bag. And on the right, you've got the non-recyclable material, things that have come in contact with the effluent. At the same time of data collection, at that point in time, we had the in and out report from March of 2021. At that point in time, we had 22.6 patients provincially on CAPD and 77.4% on CCPD. We did not have information on the breakdown between AMIA and home choice, unfortunately. So what did we find? When we looked at the polypropylene plastic, so just the outer bag plastic, the red bars are provincial data. So provincially, CAPD accounted for 1,604 kilograms of plastic waste generated. 
And when you looked at CCPD provincially, this accounted for 17,922, 29 kilograms of plastic waste generated. And I'd like you to note that this kind of plastic, the polypropylene plastic is already recyclable. This is a screenshot at BC just from this website that shows you the places that you can recycle polypropylene plastic. So our patients, our staff, our hospitals can drop our polypropylene waste in these areas to recycle their plastic waste. However, our patients are not all robust. Some of them are frail, vulnerable. We need to take leadership on this and actually help them navigate the recycling system and hopefully come up with a way to do this for our patients in the future. When we looked at the PVC recyclable waste, the numbers were even higher. So when you look at CAPD, this accounted for 6,440 eight kilograms worth of plastic per year. That is equal to 4.6 Toyota Prius cars. And when you look at that for CCPD, the number is huge, 70,548 kilograms worth of plastic waste. That is 51 Toyota Prius cars. Just wanted to make a point, this is a weight for weight comparison. It is not a weight to carbon emission comparison. So, if the polypropylene plastic waste was recycled versus landfilled, 19.72 metric ton equivalents of carbon dioxide would be saved, which is equivalent to around four vehicles um, emissions or about um, 10,083 liters of gasoline. Whilst this number might seem small to you, I'd like to let you know that it takes 50 mature trees one year to absorb one ton of CO2. So any difference you make will make a difference. Unfortunately, data is lacking for emissions um, for landfill versus PVC plastic, which is the larger contributor of the plastic waste by PD. So I'd like to conclude by saying that the amount of recyclable plastic waste that we generate in peritoneal dialysis is very significant. We already have the infrastructure in place to recycle polypropylene plastic, which is the outer cover plastic. Even though this only accounts for a minority of the overall peritoneal dialysis waste generated, it is still worth doing. Opportunities exist for medical non-biohazardous PVC recycling. The environmental benefit of recycling may be small, However, we should commit to this change. It is the step in the right direction. We need bigger infrastructural design changes to make a bigger change. And by this, I mean, we need to actually sit down and actually carbon footprint peritoneal dialysis as a whole. When I say that, I mean, look at production, distribution, transportation as well. If we can make every single step of the process green, we will make a bigger change. However, recycling is something we can do today and now, and it is an incremental step in the right direction. So what are our future directions? We need to discuss with relevant stakeholders what's required in BC to come up with a medical recycling plastic program in BC. As mentioned before, it is important to completely plan and carbon footprint peritoneal dialysis waste, um, the whole peritoneal dialysis program from production to distribution. And I'd really like to take the opportunity today to invite everyone on the call to look at their units to see if they can make one change to make the unit more green. I would like to end with this slide. There is a call for governments and leaders to act. And we as healthcare professionals need to act as global leaders in this process. We need to do everything we can to make our practice healthcare greener to actually save the planet for the future, for our future generations. With that, I'd like to finish up. I'd like to thank Dr. Caroline Stigant and the Home Dialysis Unit at Royal Jubilee Hospital. 
And with that, I'd like to finish. Um, I'd like to take two minutes just to thank everyone involved in this year for me. This year is coming to an end. Um, my fellowship's coming to an end. And I'd really like to thank UBC Nephrology, BC Renal, everyone at St. Paul's, BGH, and um, Fraser and Royal Jubilee for really welcoming me into your units and really making this year really enjoyable. I'll have to go back to Australia and say 2021 was one of the best years of my life despite COVID and that's saying something. So thank you. Thanks both of you for really outstanding uh, presentations we have. Uh, and I think you've timed it beautifully as well so that we actually have time for discussion because both of you presented um, thought provoking and uh, question initiating things. And there is a first question from Daisy asking uh, Nisha, are there any countries or provinces to benchmark um, more recyclable biological PD supplies? I think by that means, um, have there been any developments of, of um, recyclable biological um, entities or attempts to? So look, I'm not aware of them um, actually producing biologically um, like less plastic PD supplies, for instance, but I know that there is, you know, the one, two, three recycling program that they're trying to look at um, recycle PVC plastic here. And if that's all successful, that could be extrapolated into our world of peritoneal dialysis. And it's been on the agenda item um, for discussion in the PD committee meetings, but I'm not aware of them generating a specifically um, biodegradable substance to, um, yeah, to provide PD supplies with. There's questions coming. Um, Hemo, uh, Mike is actually um, in interested. I was just going to ask the same question about home hemo. One could imagine doing exactly the same quantification of plastics for home yeah. hemo as well as a kind of totality of home-based therapies creating X amount of waste. Um, so yes, that is one of our projects. So I um, am hoping to collect some data when I'm back at VGH for 15 days. Um, I started collecting some data already on the next stage machine plastic waste generated, and we're hoping to get similar data in the home hemo population. Great. Please uh, do enter your questions uh, in the chat box. If you don't like using the chat box, if you raise your hand, Brenda will unmute you. Um, Raphael, I'll ask... Um, that's probably one of the most extensive quality indicator reports I've seen for, and also beautifully visualized. So um, I'm anticipating a nice publication describing both the value of the exercise as well as the value of that going forward. Do you see any opportunity perhaps to collaborate when you go back to Montreal and adopt or adapt something like this? What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think a publication is coming up for sure. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, just doing the process of actually designing indicators, reading the literature. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, that was really interesting and valuable information just for me as a phys physician, uh, of course. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I got to say that historically, we haven't been doing too well in Quebec to register our data in the kidney world. <laughs> so that could be actually um, one step to do better. Um, and definitely this is in the, I, I'm keeping this uh, in the, on the back burner for, for when I go back for sure. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Terrific, and there's an, a question about whether um, BC as a community or BC Renal can advocate for patients to have government plastic pickup programs for dialysis patients. So I am not sure that there is one, but it would be great to have one. <laughs> Um, because, you know, things like, as I was saying, the outer cover plastic is actually already recyclable. And if there is a way to navigate through that, because that's really not contaminated at all. There is no um, effluent in there. So it would be nice to come up with a program. Great. Um, Dave Prakal has his hand up. So if you, uh, there you go, Dave, you can speak now. Hi, Nisha. Thanks. Uh... Oh. You, oh. we, can't, we can't hear you anymore. <laughs> okay, there he goes. There you go back, Dave. 
Oops, unmute. Unmute. Oh, there you are. There you go. There you go. Thanks. Thanks, Anisha and Raphael, both really excellent presentations. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, being with us for the last year. Anisha, I have a, a question for you. Uh, I, I actually, I thought your comment about how uncomfortable um, PD supplies make us all feel uh, in the unit is actually a really valid one. I think we've all felt quite uncomfortable with how much plastic byproducts uh, we utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the, the, the challenge that we have often is very jurisdictional dependent. You know, for example, in Vancouver, plastics are not actually recyclable at home. And it, it's, a, it's a laborious uh, thing to do where I collect my plastics and drive them to a specific plastic recycling center every so often. And so I would find that that would be quite challenging for patients uh, as well. Your comment about Baxter actually taking a bit of a lead on this in Australia is interesting. Um, what about corporate responsibility of Baxter to actually try to institute something uh, here in British Columbia? Um, so I'll have to let Sue Executive chip in because they have um, sort of put this on the table on the PD committee discussions with Baxter but I'm not sure much has come of that just yet, but it's a work in progress. And, you know, ideally, one of the main issues is it's not just the supplier, you also need like someone to be able to recycle the product, right? So I think you need a collaborative effort, effort with two, um, two areas, and I'm not sure that's happened just yet, but it, it is a work in progress and hopefully, you know, when I come back here someday, if you have an amazing recycling program and, you know, like the, there's heaps to learn either way. You're like, I'm hoping to go back and I don't know if they've already recycled, started recycling masks, but we're doing it here. So I'm hoping if they're not doing that to take that back with me. We have a few more questions. Uh, Carolyn's began to a bead and then Mike. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks uh, also to Raphael and, um, and Nisha. Um, if anyone hasn't checked out Nisha's blog with her time in uh, Canada, it's a, it's a fun read. So thanks for the shout outs to Victoria and uh, it was great having you here. Um, I guess just the big scope view, Nisha, was my reflection on how your two projects mesh really nicely. Um, the idea of incremental PD as being PD starting when it's clinically warranted, not earlier. Um, and phasing up is, is, I think, a key one for us to wrap our heads around in sustainability, because as we've seen, um, recycling doesn't produce the um, carbon savings return that we'd like to see on our triple bottom line of patient care, saving money, and saving environment. So I think these kinds of initiatives, initiatives with novel clinical pathways are the sort of things that those editorialists were calling out for. And Dave, I love your comments and your enthusiasm about wanting to be involved and share your call, Nisha, for everybody to think about how we can do better. And that includes novel clinical pathways that can reduce the inputs that are required. I, I might propose as well, something that I used to think was really taboo was um, an in incremental dialysis prescription at the other end. You know, perhaps as people lose some weight or we're thinking about them sort of in, a, in an end later stage in their disease or dialysis process that we could think of incremental as a potential scaling down um, as well as scaling up. So obviously that's not universally appropriate, but just carrying the thought further on the incremental front. Um, shifting, uh, there was a question about recyclable um, supplies uh, in general. Um, I'm aware that one company uh, makes a um, PVC free plastic um, and they're looking at making a more sort of, uh, it's called biofine um, solution. So, um, and there's, I actually was contacted, I think now that I wear the SNAP uh, hat, your, your name gets out and there's a manufacturer looking at making um, fully biocompatible, biodegradable um, plastic products for dialysis. Um, obviously it's in the early stages of development, but they do have plastics that are made from basically seaweed and wood fiber. So seaweed makes alginate um, and wood fiber makes cellulose. So it's an alginate cellulose plastic. Um, so there's all sorts of, um, of novel things uh, that I think we need to look at. Um, 
Thanks to Mike for mentioning the quantification of the home hemoplastics. That's certainly on our agenda. And yeah, hopefully, Nisha, um, that's, uh, that's possible to do. Um, and the final thing I wanted to mention was that um, plastic recycling, um, as I'm learning, talking to all sorts of people in this area, it's a business. Um, and we think of it as a perhaps an extension of a service within healthcare, but we have to think about it a bit differently. The recycling people need a steady supply of a good quality, quote, product. Um, and so I think something like this, where there's a highly trained patient population and potentially a single deliverer of these materials, i.e. Baxter, um, is really ripe for taking. And I think Baxter would need to have initiative to speak with the similar vinyl council within Canada um, and hopefully establish a Canadian-wide um, network here. And this is something that we're going to be looking at at the national level um, in SNAP as well. Great. Thanks, Carolyn. There's two more people that want to, and there's also a couple of um, questions in the chat that I just wanted to comment on uh, just before Abid and Mike. So one is, um, think... One is to think about blood work as another dispose, another way of quantifying things. And I know Sunita has had an interest over time about how much blood work do you really need, in, especially in PD or chronic patients after they've been established on a chronic thing. So that might be another addition to that. Um, and that PD DOPS is looking at generating projects for incremental and decremental PD. And Rafael, just thinking also whether or not incremental or, or decremental PD could be another one of the um, of the um, indicators, right? Proportion of patients on in, starting with incremental or start or on decremental and uh, recycling, right? So then you have an environmental metric as well as a patient-centered increment decrement. So that would be interesting to think about adding. Um, I'd just like to add like that in like that inclusion would make data collection as well really um, a lot easier. So it would be very useful if that could be incorporated. Capture it, it would be it would be good. We think of a, a robust way to capture it um, and then a robust way to say recycling program, yes, no. You know, just a mm -hmm. simple are you recycling the plastic that you can? Yes, no, and that would be a good way to start. Um, but uh, interesting. Thank you, Abid, and then Mike. Um, thanks very much, guys. Um, so uh, lest I sound negative, because I'm not negative about incremental PD at all, but Nisha, I was just wondering if you thought there was any impact from COVID on the apparent uptake in numbers uh, when you looked at incremental PD. So I know certainly when COVID hit, we transitioned a lot of people here at St. Paul's to PD now it didn't last for us but I'm curious to know if you thought that that might have had an impact or if you were able to look at that impact in terms of the rates when you transitioned to incremental. I don't think we specifically looked at I mean it's a bit hard to know if people chose because we it'd be nice to actually do a patient survey to see how much COVID had a part to play and how much incremental PD as a modality choice had a part to play in their decision to choose peritoneal dialysis. However, I don't think I can tell you a yes or a no to that question because we didn't, we didn't do that. We didn't actually look at the patient choice reasons. Great, thanks. Mike, uh, we're just at the bottom of the hour. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank the, the both of you for really outstanding presentations today. I think, uh, uh, in a year, the amount of work you guys have been able to do is uh, not to be underestimated. So I really appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity sort of as the program director for the home therapies to really uh, acknowledge the work you guys have done for the province uh, and thank you for the time you've, sent, you've spent with us. Uh, I always get a little bit melancholy towards the end of the year as people are heading away and uh, this year is no exception. But I'm also encouraged, uh, again, we just are having more and more global relationships uh, that uh, are, are maturing and fostering over time. So I, I want to uh, thank you guys for the work that you've done. And I actually wanted to also, I think this is the, the first time um, that I can recall the degree of collaboration around the province for, for some of the work the fellows have been doing, for the home fellows in particular. Um, they are a provincial uh, funded resource uh, and uh, I'm just really excited um, uh, with the involvement uh, that we've had from Island Health as well as Fraser and 
uh, I hope as we continue with more um, of the home fellows in the future that we'll be able to continue that sort of collaborative work. Uh, I think you guys have really moved the needle uh, this year in terms of um, uh, moving moving some of the uh, information and agenda forward. So I just really want to thank you guys. Thank you. We've loved our time here. It's been great. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Copeland. That, that, that's, that's very nice. And I want to echo Nisha's words, obviously. Um, for the past year I've been here, yeah, it was amazing <laughs> to be here during the pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Anyways, with that, um, there's a three minutes left, but really, I mean, you've given us, um, you know, a lot of things to think about, a lot of ways to improve our patient centeredness and environment centeredness at the same time, which is a pretty good win. Uh, and uh, echo the value of having both uh, uh, national and international fellows uh, join us as a kidney community um, really enriches us. Uh, as a community and hopefully allows, as Mike says, ongoing uh, collaborations when you go home. So uh, it's not goodbye, but it's uh, au revoir to see you again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.